Open your Bibles to Revelation 20. We're still in the fifth beatitude. I told you this beatitude would take us into many, many messages. In the fifth beatitude, you can find it in verse 6. We only really looked at the latter part of verse 6, and then I started to preach starting with verse 1 in chapter 20, because it's all related. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit. That bottomless pit, what is it? Where is it? And a great chain in his hand. He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, which we already cover, and cast him into this bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him. Go back to verse 1. Sure, the word bottomless pit, abyss. Now, I want to clarify because some of you think the reasons why I looked at a certain chapter in the book of Enoch, that I was saying that somewhere in Antarctica is where the abyss, or this bottomless pit. There is an abyss, but there's abysses every, well, if you really truly understand what the Greek word means for abyss, it can mean anywhere from a watery grave to something else. So it's really more of a wider definition for it. And there's a lot of abysses around this planet. And I believe Lake Vostok is one of them, but not the abyss where scripture says the bottomless pit that binds and seals these angelic forces are located that we find here in this scripture. And not just this scripture, you go to Revelation chapter 9. So, sorry to disappoint you. I went through that exercise in the book of Enoch to show you that the book of Enoch could be trusted. And I gave you an example of the geographical locations where Enoch traveled that match up. Not just in this planet, but also into outer space. And we went all the way to Pleiades, which I know exactly where I left off in Pleiades. And I'll come back to it, because we have to. But some of you were convinced. You're convinced, aha, he's saying the bombless pit is in Antarctica because I referenced Leif Bostock was one of the abysses that Enoch viewed with his own eyes as he was tra traveling around with these angelic beings. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Now, I got you scratching your head again. But go back to Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So we know there exists a bottomless pit, and we know there's a key to it. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there came out of the, and there rose out a smoke out of the pit. And the smoke of the great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by the, season, by the reason of the smoke of the pit. Now, I'm not going to get into these, this chapter at this point. But here's a bottomless pit also described. Do I think it's the same bottomless pit as we find in verse 1, chapter 20? Yes. So it has to be somewhere. There's a key to it. We know Satan eventually was chained. And... Even the heavens have declared that, and we already looked at that. The heavens declare the same message we find here in Revelation 20. So where is this pit, this bottomless pit? I'm now using Lawrence 
translation of the Book of Enoch. I told you I used more than one. Still trying to find good versions to put on other translations of the Book of Enoch on the website. At this point, we only have one, but we're working on it. I'm going to go to chapter 10, verse 1, the Lawrence translation of the book of Enoch. Then the Most High, the Great and Holy One, spoke and sent Arsayalalur, now there's a name for an angel, to the son of Lamech. saying, say to him in my name, conceal thyself. He's, he's, the son of Lamech is none other than Noah. Then explain to him that consummation was about to take place. Now, those of you who are just picking up on this message and miss all the probably half a dozen messages leading up to this point, you're probably going to be lost, confused, think I'm some weirdo that doesn't base things on God's word. Well, I recommend and suggest that you listen to those messages before you cast your judgment. Then explained to him the consummation which is about to take place. For all the earth shall perish. The waters of a deluge shall come over the whole earth, and all things which are in it shall be destroyed. Describing the flood, Noah's flood. And now teach him how he may escape and how his seed may remain in all the earth. Verse 6, chapter 10. Again the Lord said to Raphael, another angel of the Lord, bind Azael, a rebellious angel that we learned, or if you read the book of Enoch in the earlier chapters, Rebelled against God. Bind Aziel hand and foot. Cast him into darkness. I mean, Satan is the ringleader, but he has a lot of bad angels underneath him. Aziel hand and foot and cast him into darkness. And an opening, now he's describing a place. This is what you're going to do. And now an opening, the des in the, opening the, de the desert, which... But, and opening the desert, which is in Dudael. So he's telling him, bind Aziel, hand and foot, cast him into this darkness. What darkness? An opening he's going to dig out in the desert, which is in Dudael, and then cast him into this I just say pit at this point. Then after that, throw upon him hurled and pointed stones, covering him with darkness. So we know it's going to be in a desert-like place, which is in Dudael. He's going to throw him in there, cast him in there, after he binds him hand and foot, and then after that's done, he's going to throw upon him kind of the capstone or hurled the, and hurled these pointed stones. And he'll be covered in total darkness. Now that's in the Lawrence translation. Book of Enoch, chapter 10. If you have a copy, read it yourself. You can find the other translation online too. Well, ain't that interesting? Where could this possibly be? Can there be a location that we could identify on this planet today? I should just dangle you there right there right now and say I'll pick this up next time, but I think you'll hurl stones at me if I did that. So I'll continue. There is a place in the Golan Heights. The Golan Heights is a northern part 
of Israel, which was taken because of a war in the northeastern section near Mount Hermon in the bordering areas of Israel, the Golan Heights area, and Syria. Very close to Damascus, by the way. Not that far. Now, discovered in the Golan a year after it's captured in 1967, there was a place, a mysterious place, a place that displayed of concentric stone circles that has long baffled archaeologists, some dating it all the way back 5,000 years ago. And a particular stone circle, which I'll name here in a few moments, has a Hebrew name. It's called the Wheel of the Goats. Ghosts, not goats, ghosts. G-H-O-S-T-S. -S. Wheel of the Ghosts. Wow. It is reminiscent of England's famous, now don't go Googling while you're, I'm teaching. Be patient and listen in or else you'll miss something. Have some discipline. Is reminiscent of England's famous ancient megalithic structure, Stonehenge. The site consists of around 42,000 tons of basalt rocks forming four circles. Actually, there's more to it than that. I'm just giving you a brief description of it, then I'll get into it. And archaeologists believe the walls of the structure once towered nine meters high, making the structure an especially impressive sight when viewed from the air. Like Stonehenge, this place appears connected to the Earth's place in the cosmos, as every year it aligns with the summer and winter solstice. Unsurprisingly, theories abound as to this place's role. From expected hypotheses revolving around astronomical observations and calendars to moving uh, to more, excuse me, intriguing whispers about biblical giants from the heavens. No one has been able to say exactly why the ancients so carefully arrange seasonally of rocks in this spot. No one's able to say exactly what this is. Well, we'll see. This place is only accessible by foot and is located about a third of the way between roads 808 and 98 in the Golan Heights, around an hour's walk from the road. If hiking in this region, be careful to stay on marked trails as there are landmines around the area. That was a brief description. Let's get into a little bit more detail. I'll even show you some pictures tonight. We know there's a pit. We know that Raphael dug this pit. In the Book of Enoch, they put Azael, I think more than Azael's in this pit, by the way. So he opened this pit. He shut this pit in the Book of Enoch. We know in the scriptures that there's a key to this pit that can open it up. The question is, how many times has it been opened? We know of an, of an occasion that it will be opened. I believe at least twice in the scriptures. But I'm not, once again, boxing in God to say that's the only amount of time that it can be opened or closed letting things in and putting things in, and letting things out and putting things into it. Book of Enoch gives us the answer. It was the angel Raphael who was commanded to shut up the bottomless pit over Isael. 
one of the leaders of the corrupt pre-flood angels. Now in the book of Enoch, the location of this opening is given ge geographically. You really think about it, what I've covered so far is just a very small section of the book of Enoch. It's one heck of a travel map, isn't it? Not just for this planet, but for areas outside this planet into space. I bet you Captain Kirk from Star Trek would have loved to have Enoch on board as his guide, tour guide of the galaxies. Now, in the book of Enoch, the location of this opening is given geographically. The problem is that we don't know what that place is. Or where? It's called the desert in Dudael. I read that already to you in Enoch 10. There's no place with that name on earth today. And there are no ancient records talking about where it is. So how are we going to know? But there is something that may give us a clue to where it is placed. And that is in Leviticus 16. Let's go there. Okay, let's go to Leviticus 16. In Leviticus 16, this is where, in a certain section of Leviticus 16, where it speaks of Azael. Let's see if I can find it real quick. This is referring to the scapegoat. They, they have atonement and leading up to the scapegoat. Let's just start with verse 20. And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head, I'm in verse 21, of the live goat to confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness." Now, I plan maybe during this section of the series to go into this goat. I'm not sure yet. There's a lot to be understood concerning these verses, concerning the scapegoat. But let's continue, not tonight, not to this morning, excuse me. And the goat shall bear upon him all the iniquities upon the land not inhabited, and he shall let the goat in the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land. Unto a land. Not inhabited. Some translations will say unto a land of separation. And he shall let the goat go in this wilderness. Oh, I'm tempted to go into this goat tonight, but I'm not going to do it. And then you continue reading down to verse 26, it says, And he that let the goat go for the scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe in flesh and his flesh and water, and afterwards come into the camp. And it gives you more instructions. When it's supposed to happen, 
how it's supposed to happen, and so forth. Now, well, I probably should have backed this all the way up because, well, let's just read it. Well, you can read it for yourself because there's two goats. And both these goats, one lot was for the Lord, and the other lot was for the scapegoat. The scapegoat. You find that in verse 8. So on your own time, read the whole chapter. And like I said, I'm tempted to come back to this and just do a thorough teaching on this goat. But in verse 8, probably should have read that first and then read you the rest of the verses. But let's back up now to verse 8. It says, well, for back it up to verse 7. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And verse 8 then reads, And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other lot for the scapegoat. Circle that word scapegoat. You know what it translates to in the Hebrew? Azazel. Azael or Azazel. So Azael or Azazel is what this translates to. Which was offered for the sin offering. One of the goats and the other in which the lot fell to be the scapegoat. It shall present it alive before the Lord to make an atonement upon him and let him go for a scapegoat into this wilderness. This scapegoat was representing Azazel and then let go into this wilderness, this unha uninhabited place that was separated from the land and the people of Israel. Now, I'm going to have to come back to this because there's a lot more to it than I'm going to cover tonight, obviously. But for the sake of just trying to put the pieces together tonight, I'm going to move quickly through this tonight or this morning. And that is in Leviticus 16 where it speaks of Azazel, which I already went back to and looked at. We find Azazel mentioned. Of course, you read through the scriptures in the King James or other versions, it just reads scapegoat. Well, that scapegoat had a name. And a purpose and a meaning. Now the Hebrews must have known about the book of Enoch and where the desert was, which was called Dudael. And they were commanded by God to let out the scapegoat to Azazel in the desert. So now we at least know that this desert, with this opening to the bottomless pit, and something else, which I'll get to later on, is in one of the deserts near to Israel. So we got the book of Leviticus bringing up the two goats, one being a scapegoat, one in the Hebrew meant Azazel in its name, which this goat would then would be taken outside the camp or outside of Israel into a location as it's uninhabited, a wilderness, and left there. That's all I'm going to mention about this scapegoat today. So where is this place? That's the point I want to really focus on in the few minutes that we have left. Where is this place? Do we know in what direction this desert lay? Yes, we know that in the Hebrew tradition, the goat was led or led eastward by a man. Eastward by a man. And then loosed out in the desert places or deserted places. And that makes it plain that the desert in Dudael must be in some deserted area 
somewhere east of Jerusalem. Now, if we go east of Jerusalem, there are some small desert areas north of the Dead Sea. But those parts weren't desert or deserts until after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, which was later in time. So that can't be the direction. Now, if we go east of Jerusalem, there are some small desert areas north of the Dead Sea, but those parts weren't desert until after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Before that, they were, the, they were as the Garden of Eden, we are told, or like the Garden of Eden. But going further east, across the Jordan and a bit north, we end up in the wasted lands of the giants. Those giants, the Rephaim, were killed and their cities deserted under the time of Moses and Joshua, the remnants of the giants. This area is what is known as Galantis, or the Golan Heights. That's how you would recognize it today. But already in Stone Age times, that is, before the flood, there were built there, there were built huge monolithic tombs, hundreds or thousands, and people don't usually live in graveyards. Could this be the desert in Dudael? There is much to suggest that. Where else could it be? In the book of Enoch, Raphael is told to dig an opening in the desert and to put Azazel, probably still alive, in the grave. And he pointed and hung hoon stones over him. In other words, he was to build a huge cairn or stone mound over the angel. This is a real clue because then we have a description to search for. If we can find this curtain, we also have found the desert in Dudael. And thus the opening of something else, which I'll get to. You follow me so far? So what is this place? Put it on the screen, first picture. This place is called Gilgal Raphaim. Gilgal Raphaim. In Hebrew, it means Wheel of the Ghosts. Wheel of the Ghosts. Gilgal, G I L G A L, if you want to spell it. Raphaim. R E F A I M. This stone circle is the only undertaking in the Middle East. Some have dated around 3000 BC. Recognize the date, 3000 BC? Around the days of Enoch. In the same geographical area, probably where Enoch lived. Now, interesting. Keep it on there till I tell you to move it. Remember I read to you just a few moments ago, those giants, the Rephidim, were killed in the cities that deserted under the time of Moses and Joshua? This area was known as Galantis, or the Golan Heights. Now, Galantis is the same word as in Ezekiel's wheels, Gaga. It means circle. So, Galantis is the land of the circle or the circles. The word Gaul is very common in the area of Galilee, or the Golan or slash Galantis, Gilgal, 
Gilead. It seems that the old stone circle, which has been there since before the flood, has been in the center of people's minds all the time. Also further east, in Syria, there are masses of another type of stone circles of a lower build in the desert areas, human-made. But this one's unique. So then we have a huge stone circle consisting of 40,000 tons of rocket, rocky, excuse me, unhewn stones with a tomb in its middle, lying in the desert northeast of Jerusalem and being the only such monument of that age in the whole of the Middle East. Possibly older than the pyramids, older than the ruins of Babel, and in the Book of Enoch, we have a description of a similar stone monument from that same age in the same proximity close to Mount Hermon. What else could it be other than this stone circle? There are no other similar kerns. It's from the same age. It's built the same kind of stones. It's a tomb, although probably rebuilt in latter times. Put another picture out there. Go to the second picture. That kind of looks like it needs maybe a possible key to unlock that. And it's kind of blurry, I know, the picture, but... By the way, there's a way to enter this from a certain direction. But I'll get to that probably next time. Now I'll go to the next picture. To give you some idea where this might be located. You see there, in the lower part of the screen, Israel, Jordan, Gaza Strip. Then you move up to the West Bank that's circled in that red area. And then you see... Gilgal Raphaim, just right of the word Lebanon in this map. Gilgal Raphaim, that's in the Golden Heights. So that gives you a better geographical idea where this is located. Go to the next picture. I think there's one more picture. That gives you a different angle. How come nobody knows about this? Only rediscovered after being hidden in 1967. Keep it on that picture now for a while. To show you how massive this is, you take the, you take myself and put it in this picture somewhere from this angle, I would be just a dot somewhere in this picture. This is not some small little stone circle, is what I'm trying to say. And most strange of all, the circle itself is set to about 3000 BC. It was discovered that in the year 3000 BC, in the summer solstice, the rays of the sun went through the northeast entrance and hit the tomb in the middle of the circle. In 1968, Professor Mizrahi of the Department of Anthropology at Harvard University and Professor Anthony Avini of Colgate University discovered that in 3000 BC, the first rays of the summer solstice would have apparently directly appears, excuse me, directly through the northeast opening as seen from the central tumulus. At the same time, the southeast opening provided a direct view of Sirius. That's interesting. Yeah. And may I remind you that the Syrian capital Damascus is only about 100 kilometers from the circle. We may also be reminded about two possessed men in that area that we find in the gospel records. They lived among the graves, according to the gospels, and they had lots of knowledge about the end times. You want to read the story, you'll find that in Matthew and Luke, by the way. No, no and also Mark. I'll give you the scriptures. Matthew 8, 28, verses, 30, verses 8 through 34, it says Matthew 8, 
verses 28 through 34, Mark 5, verses 1 through 20, and Luke 8, 20, 26 through 39. I repeat, Matthew 8, verses 28 through 34, Mark 5, verses 1 through 20, and Luke 8, verses 26 through 39. So you can read about Jesus' confrontation with these possessed individuals, which had a lots of knowledge about the end times. If we go to Israel today, the area east of Sea of Galilee will where Gilgal Rephaim is located, in fact, is littered with old stone age graves. These graves called domens. These graves are called domens. In Europe, those graves were believed to be built by giants. And in Golan, the Bible tells us that the giants of King Og lived until the days of Moses and Joshua. So it was in this area that those two possessed men lived, plagued by the Nephilim spirits from the dead giants. And of course, they knew about the end times. They were there when the events told in the book of Enoch took place. Those Nephilim spirits know where the opening to the abyss is, and they guard it, because there is where their fathers will return, if they haven't already. I haven't said one way or the other after those 70 generations are gone, which I haven't got into yet. Now, isn't that interesting? I think it's interesting. Could this be what you're seeing on the surface, the area that leads to the bottomless pit right below it? Could this be it? And by the way, well, Maybe I'll save that for next time. Could this be it? Could this be the direction where the goat, the scapegoat, was led to? The scapegoat Aziel. Could this wheel of the ghost in Hebrew be the pit that Raphael dug to put Aziel? And since then, other, I believe, beings since that time. Could this be it? Was 3000 BC the date that this took place? Or was there some other date? Could Giga Raphaim be the entrance? of the bombless pit and could there be a key that unlocks it come back to me these are all interesting questions something that needs to be pursued and if pursued then can we connect the dots To better understand and make the scriptures come alive, yes, this is not some figurative, make-believe place. It is a real place. Which is described in the book of Revelation, not just in 20, but in chapter 9. An evil place. A place where evil is put in and also released. God's word is the most interesting thing that you can ever read. The problem is you need understanding to go along with it. Not some super spiritual made up theories, but possibilities of facts on the ground, no pun intended, to bring out the truth, 
that God declared through his word. I don't believe Jesus was given this revelation and it was passed on. I believe to Daniel and Daniel to John to create a good science fiction story or some kind of a mystery. He was revealing to him real places, real times, and real events that I believe, for the most part, we could put some facts to it and see it come alive, how real it is. Now, I have more to say about this, but I want to know now, right now if you think this is interesting. If you think this is a strong possibility, where Azazel and other evil beings have been locked up. Not the only place for prisons of angels. I believe in the area of the Pleiades, as I pointed out. There are many there too, but there are certain kinds that are locked up in this location. Now, if you think this is interesting, let me know. Play a song.